In the 1950s, America had broken free from the shackles of wartime economics. It was walking with the swagger of a nation that had the world by the tail. Scientists had harnessed nuclear energy. Jet-propelled airplanes were breaking speed records, and the race to space was on. But perhaps more than anything else, one thing melded imagination and consumerism, putting this era in perfect context. The concept car. Unlike satellites, rockets, and jet planes, these dream cars were accessible. People flocked to auto shows to see concept cars in their titanium-bodied glory. They were snapshots of how America perceived its future. They were simply out of sight, unforgettable. But what happened to them? Most were destroyed, some just plain vanished. But amazingly, some are still here. Introducing the 1957 Simca Special. That cave existed in 1957. That cur would have come screaming out of it. The 1933 Aeromobile. It reminds most of the young people of Little Nemo. With the fishtail and the orange color, it becomes quite a hit. And the 1959 Scimitar Station Wagon. The brushed finish, the polished work in the front. The point was to show off how many th ways you can use aluminum in the automobile. special makes you feel like you're out cruising on a summer night in the 1950s. It appeals to our childhood. Uh, it brings me back to being a kid in the Jetson era. It's immediately what you conjure up in your head uh, when you look at that car. Those are the feelings, the sentiments you get around it. The body is long and smooth, climaxing with a dramatic back end. The fins are such a dominant feature on that car. It's really unique to be such a small sports car and have those big fins on it. Those are freaking Cadillac size fins on a little sports car, it's awesome. When it was originally built, it had a one piece bubble canopy, giving it a look suited for a superhero. I swear if that cave existed in 1957, that car would have come screaming out of it. It's the wedge, the fins, it's amazing in shape. It's really, it's from a period. It screams late 50s. In 1957, the American car business was dominated by the big three, Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler. Of the six million cars made that year, 95% were built by those three corporations. The Simca Special is an exception. It was built by a sophomore at Notre Dame University, Virgil Exner Jr. From the time I was a little kid, got soapbox derbies and all that, I wanted to build a car. <laughs> and I uh, just uh, loved doing that. It's no surprise he grew up wanting to build a car. His father was Virgil Exner Sr., a legendary automotive designer famous for his low, sleek cars with flamboyant fins. We were you know, always together, he listened to me. And um, he brought me up to be a designer, and that's what was always in store for me. 
Through his dad, Virgil Jr. got in touch with an Italian car designer. In summer of 1954, he sold me a modified frame from a Simca. A Simca is a small but fast European car, similar to a Fiat at the time. He sold me the basic frame that he had modified uh, to split out wide uh, so that uh, two people could sit down low in the car. That became the basis of the Simca Special. I formed tubing and whatnot to build a superstructure, you might say. And from there and then on, I started to design a sports car at Notre Dame. Virgil was actually a fine art student, and it took a special exemption for him to claim his car design as art. At that time, they did not allow uh, students at Notre Dame to have cars at all. And so uh, I've been known as the only student who was allowed to have a car at Notre Dame. Virgil made full-sized clay molds, then cast a fiberglass shell of the body and mounted it to the chassis. After three years of work, the Simca Special was finally complete, and not a moment too soon. Virgil and his car spent the next year and a half on opposite sides of the planet. special is the creation of Virgil Exner Jr., the son of Virgil Sr., the man that gave cars of the 1950s their distinctive style. The younger Exner designed his car at Notre Dame University and submitted it as his graduate thesis. I finished the car during that summer before I had to go into active duty with the Air Force. When I was in the service, I was first stationed in Korea for a year. While Virgil was serving his country, his car was becoming famous. I turned the car over, the, the Simca, to a small sports car shop in Detroit to store. And uh, they said, do you mind if we show the car around at various hot rod shows and stuff like that? And I said, no, not at all. Well, it turned out that they, uh, they showed it at a couple of sports car shows and I got all kinds of trophies <laughs> I never saw. They also were contacted by the Henry Ford Museum uh, to show the car uh, as part of their annual sports cars in review show. That show grew an international audience. The Simca people had come over and saw the show at the Henry Ford Museum and noticed that this car was designed by Virgil Exner Jr. and inquired to my father about it and they said, can we uh, take the car to Paris and show it in the Paris show that year? And my father called me up <laughs> and I was in Korea at the time. <laughs> my father called me up and said, do you mind if they do that? <laughs> God, of course I don't mind, you know? The car was wildly popular at the 1959 Paris Auto Show. And when this show was over, it was returned to the States. They shipped it back to me. And as a gift for allowing them to show it at Paris, they sent me a brand new Fiat 1500 Sports Roadster. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it blew my mind, you know. When he left the Air Force, Virgil sold the Simca to a collector in California. Later, it was put up for auction and bought by a man in Texas. It sold for $550,000. The fellow that bought it was the lawyer that had settled the Enron oil a settlement and obviously made millions and he was a car nut and he started to build up a collection of cars and he had over 800 of them. In 2010, 
it was auctioned off again, this time to Fred Phillips, a collector in Calgary, Alberta, who has oh, big plans for like the tiny that. car. Him and his father driving around in the original chassis, the finished car. The original design of that car, uh, Virgil put a bubble roof on it, which is just a solarium. I mean, you were encapsulated under acrylic. And uh, subsequent, uh, another fella purchased the car and kind of modified it to be his own, and he's added this T-roof to it. And for me, just the pure design. It's Virgil's car. It's going back. And uh, we talked to Virgil about putting it back to the period configuration. He's excited. I don't know who's more excited, him or me, but we can't wait to do that to the car. Virgil has even given Fred the original drawings to assist with the restoration. For the money shot, Virgil's original idea sketch from August 30th of 1954. And you can see the finished product is really not that far off. Virgil Exner Jr.'s family connections certainly helped get his car noticed. The Aeromobile didn't need any help attracting attention. the biggest little city in America. It's a place where you find a lot of surprises, including a car that looks like a fish. It reminds most of the young people of Little Nemo. With the fishtail and the orange color, it becomes quite a hit. It looks like it could swim but his creator actually wanted it to fly. In 1934, Paul Lewis uh, in Colorado decides he's going to build an aircraft, um, small commuter plane uh, and, and that sort of thing. And he develops uh, a company, he calls it Lewis American Airways, uh, starts selling stock. What he faced was a chicken and egg problem. He needed a prototype to raise money but he needed the money to build a plane. His dream never got off the ground. The Securities and Exchange Commission stepped in, accused him of illegal business practices, and fined him the hefty sum of $25. In the meantime, this self-taught engineer decides, maybe I should build a car instead. It'll sell more, you know, that sort of, more, more demand for automobiles. So he comes up with the idea for this streamlined, teardrop, inexpensive automobile. He hopes to be able to sell this thing for about $300. With the help of some engine builders in New York City, he created a three-wheeled car. It's front-wheel drive and has an air-cooled engine. All very radical at the time. It's very much an economy car. It's a little four-passenger, say, small four-cylinder engine, about 50. 60 horse, a three-speed transmission. Being a three-wheeler also cuts down on the cost. You know, less suspension, another tire to work with, that sort of thing. It also gives him the opportunity to bring that unique teardrop shape to the car so that it, you know, has an ultimately streamlined look. And also, to take in the bumper and everything, he gives it a cute little whale tail at the back and uh, makes it very popular with the younger set. Today, People are attracted to the playful shape and color. But in 1934, at the height of the Depression, it was the fuel economy that got noticed. Thanks to its lightweight and aerodynamic shape, the Aeromobile got 44 miles to the gallon, comparable to a modern-day Toyota Prius. Lewis had plenty of brilliant ideas. What he was short on was cash trying to drum up interest and, and, and a dealer network in the automobile and he felt that the only way he could do that was to prove the viability of the automobile and also to get out where the public could see it. So he traveled all over the United States. There was 36 states in the one tour he took uh, at nearly 40,000 miles, uh, stopping in little towns along the way and basically just pulling up in the town square and waiting for a crowd to show up and then selling them on the idea of buying stock. Unfortunately, Lewis's grassroots fundraising triggered a return visit from an old friend. 
he's now got bankroll and everything to go. Here comes the SEC again. Paul Lewis was a self-taught engineer with a dream to build an efficient and affordable three-wheeled car. He takes the automobile on a tour, uh, you know, to develop interest in selling stock and develop a dealer network. He covers 30-odd states with the automobile. It performs very well. He brings it home. He's now got bankroll and everything to go. Here comes the SEC again. They don't like his prospectus. Once again, the Securities and Exchange Commission accused him of selling stock in a fraudulent company. He had little investors, he had big investors. He kind of changed his numbers whenever it suited him. You know, if a guy only had 10 bucks, well, we'd take the 10 bucks and go from there. It took three years of fighting in court, but eventually Lewis cleared himself of all charges. With that behind him, he gave the Aeromobile one more try. They redesigned the automobile, the front, front end of it, to make it a little more conventional looking, and he takes it on the road again in 1937. This time it doesn't seem, the people have cooled to the idea, and they're not much interested. He can't develop any money, he's lost his interested people for dealers, he brings the car home after about 40 odd thousand miles, basically broke. Uh, the automobile is confiscated by someone he owed money to. Uh, he declares bankruptcy, the project is over with. I fully think he was intended on building an automobile, that he really felt he could deliver it to the public. It just didn't work out for him financially. Paul Lewis died in 1990 at the age of 94, still insisting that if not for the interference of government bureaucrats, he'd be a millionaire many times over. The Aeromobile was the passion project of a single man. The Scimitar Wagon was created by one of the biggest companies in America. The 1959 Scimitar station wagon is a car that defies classification. Totally conceptual automobile, yet not ever intended for production. Uh, so it makes it rather different. It wasn't a personalized coach-built car, and it's not a car the uh, manufacturer is going to run with. It's, it puts it in a unique niche there. It looks like a little Art Deco and a little bit 70s disco. The automobile is fully functional. You can get in it, you can drive it. It has nice leather seating and the upholstery is very nice, trimmed out nicely. The point was to show off what you could do. So you have different finishes, the brushed finish, the polished work in the front and on the rear bumpers. And of course, through the center line of the car, we see the classic scimitar stripe here, which is where the automobile gets its name, the shape of the Arabic sword. It's an important piece of automotive history, but not because of what it looks like or what it was built for, but rather for what it is made of, aluminum. Old aluminum was a large manufacturing concern that actually goes back to 1892 when they were formed as a uh, manufacturer of Boston powder in the Midwest. The company became an industrial giant by producing ammunition during the First World War and then rankings for World War II. To expand their operations after the war, they purchased our rights for aluminum production, including a bauxite mine in Africa. Initially, aluminum was very expensive and sales were slow. They decided that they needed to show what could be done with aluminum, and they figured no better way than to enter the automobile industry. To do that, instead of just bringing in samples of aluminum, they got in touch with Brooks Stevens and decided to build an automobile using as much aluminum as they possibly could. 
At the time, Brooke Stevens was a cutting edge industrial designer who created iconic looks for everything from trains to toasters. Anything you see that looks metallic is aluminum. The steel parts are painted because steel will corrode. So, you know, we do that for the structural part of the automobile, but all the other bright work on the machine you see are, are polished aluminum. There's even a retractable roof over the back seats that's made of aluminum. Brooks Stevens recycled that idea in 63 when he drew up the Wagon Air for Studebaker. The scimitar was displayed all around the world. It was originally shown at the Geneva Show in Switzerland. It was also shown at technical product shows here in the United States by Olin Aluminum to show off what they could do and what their products could be used for. Unfortunately for Olin, it wasn't the success they had hoped for. Not initially, no. I say the, the cost of aluminum, we weren't much interested in lightweight machines. It never really caught on the way Olin wanted it to. So it was an interesting exercise that came for nothing. Eventually, they got out of the aluminum business. Later on, you know, 20 years downwind, we get into the fuel crisis, that sort of thing. Aluminum starts to become very important. Your automobile today uses a great deal of aluminum in body skins and internal components to lighten the automobile up. The Scimitar's life as a show car lasted less than five years. Mid-1960s, they've kind of used up the idea. And the car's starting to look a little dated, you know, by the middle 60s. And so they're literally disposed of. They basically just let them go. Our automobile uh, was purchased by an executive in the company. He used it for his personal use, and it ended up in the middle of Wyoming in a uh, private collector's possession. That's when the National Automobile Museum in Nevada decided to add it to their collection. The gentleman from Wyoming uh, volunteered to drive it out, so it's a fully roadable automobile. Drove it from Wyoming to Reno and delivered it to the uh, automobile collection in the middle 60s. And that is where it still sits today. A fascinating example of how even huge companies sometimes head down the wrong road. No matter how well connected, hardworking, or rich and powerful you might be, producing a brand new car is incredibly difficult. The odds of any concept car making it into mass production are extremely long. In most cases, all that is left is a single example of what could have been. <laughs>